allergies. It's been here for the whole day. This is it. This is the last of the last homilies today for me. My last mass in this church on Sunday. Um, and I wanted to focus, I guess, on not really the whole time, but the beginning. Um, what Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Um, and for every person here, it means something different, right? Um, for some of you who have um, had a relationship with me somehow, spiritually or as a priest, you know, priest and his people, confessor maybe, um, counselor or anything, or I have visited you in the hospital, or I have spent time with your children. For some of you, you may feel my heart is troubled today because Father David is leaving. For me, um, there are some anxieties right now in my life ever since the bishop called me and told me where I'm going um, because it is going to be a very different ministry and I'm leaving the only parish I know, the only parish that I have gotten to know in my entire priesthood because I've been ordained three years and I've been here three years and I'm going to be doing um, Hispanic ministry in a month, which is pretty um, stressful given that I don't have uh, Spanish, um, I don't speak Spanish, um, but I will take the first Spanish Mass and preach in a month, that's what the bishop told me, so do not let your hearts be troubled, um, yes Lord, and we move on, basically, have a lot of faith. I wanted to emphasize today in my message um, the importance of the community of people. I'll tell you how I have experienced you, going through a few examples from my three years here, how you have influenced me, how you have helped me change, and how you have helped me to see um, my deficiencies, my fears, and my talents, maybe some of them. And, and also I'll tell you about the importance of the pastor how important he is. Um, because the first parish, you're my first parish, for every priest is the most crucial experience. You get out of the seminary, you go to your first parish, and it will define your whole priesthood. Because for some priests, as I know, I've heard from, some priests um, were left devastated and discouraged after their first experience. Because for many reasons, they may have been rejected by the people, they may have not been supported by the pastor, or they may have some issues themselves, and they didn't find anybody there in the parish to help them. And so they even regretted they had, they had ever become priests, just after the first assignment. And it's said that a lot of priests left before the end of their first assignment. It can leave a priest encouraged, and even more willing to go out to the world and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And fortunately, I see myself in the second category, okay? So we don't have any doubts. Uh, I cannot see myself, even after those three years, doing anything else in my life. And here I wanted to say something to those people who are young and sometimes hear from their parents even, or friends, I just cannot see you doing this, or I cannot see him doing that, or I, I cannot imagine you doing this in the future, because that's exactly what I had heard throughout my preparation to priesthood. I can never see him being a priest. Well, guess what? I've been for three years, and I feel great about it, and I feel encouraged to do it more for the rest of my life. I just cannot see doing anything else. And part of that process has been you because of the way we have interacted for all those three years. And all of these experiences, I count as blessings from God, good or bad. Some of you may remember my first few weeks in this parish because you are here, unlike the pastor, right, who was on his vacation, well deserved. Yes, you, um, you would wish that you were here at 7.45 when he was actually sitting in that chair and I was preaching the homily when I said that. He was on vacation and I was crashed, right? My first few days, you remember, with uh, murder in our parish, funeral, then just spending time with the devastated family. Um, and then next week was a suicide and spending time with that family and having that funeral. 
And after those 10 days, I was just ready to give up. I went to the chapel, I said to God, you know, uh, if this is how it's going to be, I'm just not fit for it, I can't do it. And it was an honest conversation with God, but it was necessary. God proved to me immediately, in the first days of my priesthood, just to let me know that He is going to be in charge of that priesthood. He is going to be in charge of my ministry, and not me, with all of my ideas. And it would have been nice to have a pastor there around, right, to be there. And I'm not saying this to emphasize his lack of judgment at that particular time. Because I'm not saying that for that purpose. I'm saying that to emphasize the importance of the pastor. Extremely important person for the newly ordained priest. And all of this is to help you realize how much impact you will have on these, the guy who is coming here after me. Next month, you will have here a brand new priest, straight from the seminary, Father Vernon Knight. And he will come here with all of those ideas, great visions for the perfect church, perfect families, perfect parish, perfect liturgy, beautiful everything. And he will be stopped, just like I was, to reconsider what he is actually thinking and who is in charge of his vocation. And he will need you to be very understanding, very forgiving, and very patient with him. And you have been with me, most part, for the most part. And also you will have a seminarian here, Patrick. And for him, it will be a decisive experience in his journey to the priesthood, like it was for me, some five, six, seven years ago when I came here as a seminarian. I was ready at that moment when I came to this parish as a seminarian, I already left the formation in my head and I was heading back to Poland to stay there and never think about priesthood again. And I came here and that experience confirmed my vocation. I went back to the seminary, a changed person and I was new. No one could have convinced me otherwise that I was called to be a priest. And hopefully, that's what will happen to Patrick. Tell me, make him and those allergies. Something else. It's a new experience altogether for me. Um, <laughs> the first parish is like a secondary seminary that verifies all of our ideas, those sometimes utopian dreams about everything, and it verifies our deepest fears. And you probably don't know that, but one of my deepest fears was working with the youth. It was my greatest desire, and at the same time, the greatest fear. And I told them that. My first Mass with Mount the Sales, present here in this church, I think some 500 of them, at the church, and I'm preaching here, my first Mass in front of them. And I told them, you know, I, I feel completely overwhelmed right now. And they just looked at me and were like, well, what did he say anyway? I cannot understand his accent, you know how they are. It's like, whatever, okay, let's just go back to our stuff on the phone. <laughs> but that was the first experience. I didn't know if they understood me. I, you know, I just, I didn't know what to tell them. It was all just kind of feeling, maybe thinking you're right or no. Very interesting experience. But it was my greatest fear. And I had to progressively overcome this in order to minister to them, to feel comfortable with them. And the closer they got, the smaller the chapel, the more nervous I was. And I always told them that. So here at St. Joseph's, I celebrated the sacraments for the first time. The Eucharist, my first time you remember, some of you. Funeral, baptism, marriage, anointing of the sick. I heard my first confessions. And those who came to me during that first confessions, first weeks, they will never forget them because the penances that they received were very different than penances that you usually receive when you go. There were not three Hail Marys. You could not complete them in five minutes. You know, it's a little different when you have to stay in church for 10 hours straight, in silence, on your knees, and beg for forgiveness. But even that experience, of course, changed me and my way of hearing confessions and your way, those people's way of approaching the sacrament, which was a tremendous experience. So many things. And it was here, and I, need, I think it's important for you to know that we feel those things and know 
that for the first time I felt rejected and resented as a priest from some of you. And for the first time I received this letter um, criticizing me for what I had said in my army. And I received that letter, I was just sitting in my office reading it, could not believe that it actually was happening. Because, you know, we all have good intentions, right? So we want to just make sure that we try to lead people closer to God and then we get um, punished for it. So I was reading it, I went to Father McDonald's office immediately, and I was just like, you know, I just got one of those. And he acted like as if he had seen those before, in his own mailbox, maybe. <laughs> Very professional, told me exactly what to do, what to take from them, what not to take. Um, and actually, funny thing, at 9.30 Mass, the man who had written the letter came up to me, because I preached at 9.30 Mass, and he said, laughing, Father, were you talking about me? And I said, just like Jesus said to Pilate, you have said so. And he, <laughs> and he, <laughs> and he shook my head and he left. Um, but ever since, you know, you've been in touch. But those things happen for a reason and they're good things. Because they help us realize that it's a very human experience, you know, being a priest with your people and that that you are dealing with real human beings, with feelings, with their own opinions. Sometimes we may you know, tend to forget those things when we are so high here. Uh, but it makes all things more real. Sometimes it may be tough, but my gosh, it is a reminder of that some things don't change. You know, Jesus Christ talked about it. He said, the closer you get to me, the closer to the truth, and the more you proclaim it, the more you will be rejected. And it's good to start learning that as my plan is never to stray from the truth of Jesus Christ, never to compromise the difficult topics of the Catholic Church and always preach about them. And I know that sometimes I'll meet, meet with opposition, but I cannot do any, any other way. And I hope you will pray for me that I will always stay in tune with what the Church teaches and protect it. Because I want to protect your children whenever I go. And sometimes myself and you from ourselves, and that's what the church does in Jesus Christ's message, and we pay, pay the price for it, but it's so worth it. And here at St. Joseph's, it was the first time also as a priest I had to um, protect some of my, or prove that my promises were not just empty words, right? I had told you when I came here the first time that I would chase after your young people. And it has always been on my mind, and not something that I invented then at the time. And I think I've been doing it as much as I could, as, I, as much as I was allowed by you parents to, um, or my own pastor. I've tried to do it, but I can tell you this, that it is a very uh, demanding and, and difficult ministry. It's, it requires so much attention, so much patience, which I don't have, um, but I'm learning, I guess. Um, and spiritual life. A lot of prayer and discernment because you may end up, or I may end up, I may have end up, ended up um, serving more myself than serving them or God. And there was a point in my interactions with the young people where I actually stopped and started re-evaluating in the chapel everything that I have gone through with them to make sure that I'm not going to do it for my own sake. And I withdrew a little bit to make sure, and it was a work of my spiritual director and myself. Um, and I think that also has prepared me a little bit more to understand the next group of young people that I will see at St. Teresa's Church, which, you know, they have 1,000 children in Sunday school. I mean, I'm going to some completely different reality there. And the youth group, they don't know what's coming, but I know. And it's going to be different. Hopefully we'll have some projects that we can connect with this church. But it was one of those experiences that also made me realize that young people will always be one of the main focuses of my Christian ministry. And that's thanks to this experience of this parish. You may wonder if I have any regrets. Yeah, I do have regrets and I thought about them too. But I wanted to tell you what I don't regret, just so you know. Um, I don't regret, with full responsibility I say that, anything that I have said from this moment.
that I don't regret even one word because all of this had been preceded by prayer and reflection and everything I wanted to say, I did say from here. And I'm completely at peace with it. There are things like human faults, um, bad responses sometimes to word situations, or young people in need. I didn't know how to respond to them effectively, or some elderly people. I may have done a little bit of a greater job with visiting them, although I did make friends with a lot of those shut-ins, and I will miss them because I will discover also that that's part of my ministry that I really like, to visit people who are elderly and by themselves, and I think that's going to be also a big focus of my ministry for the rest of my life. That's the things I think that will happen. And the one regret that I have is also that I haven't remembered too many of your names. And sometimes people think, okay, he doesn't know my name, he doesn't know me, he doesn't care. It's not like that. Especially, I think, with foreign priests. When you have a biblical name, that's not a problem. I know the Bible, all the scriptures in English, I remember it quickly. If you have a name that is not biblical, it's just another vocabulary word in English that I have to memorize, and it's difficult, you might not see you all the time. Patrick, Patrick, can you come up here? There is this, he's this altar server. Yeah, show yourself, because I've been talking about him all day long and nobody knows what he looks like. There is Patrick, thank you Patrick, you can go back. <laughs> you see? That's why I like to train them. The younger they are, the better, because they listen, right, very quickly. They, you tell them, fold your hands, and they fall, and they're just awesome. Um, so he's a fifth grader, that's the first time he's serving. And last week I've been um, training them, because Father McDonald wants to have them ready um, as soon as the new year begins. And as we were walking back to school, because after the training I had to walk them back to school, because they cannot go by themselves. Patrick came up to me, he's like, hey, Father Dami, do you know my name? And I said, yeah, sure, what is it? And he just looked at me, and he said, oh. <laughs> and I said, okay, I know, Patrick, right? So I know all those names, but I know you in Jesus Christ. And I think that's the most important thing, that I know you in Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, very quickly, you're not going to hear me again for a long time. As I said to the bishop a few months ago when he called me and he wanted to talk, well actually we met, and he wanted to talk about this assignment because he didn't know if he, who to send here after me. And he wanted to talk about my future, what I would like to do, even though he already had made up his mind, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I told him, I said, Bishop, I could not have had a better experience for my first parish because I got to do all the things priests need to do in order to, to check themselves, to see if this is what they're supposed to be doing and how they are doing to evaluate. I said I could not have asked for a better pastor than Father McDonald who was always there in his office when I needed to go and ask somebody for advice or complain about something. He was always there, even though sometimes he would disagree when he gave me an advice, I would say, no way, I'm not going to do that. But he would still be there. And Father Godfrey, always there, always just humble, even though, you know, I was left in charge for three months. I'm like, you know, he's been a priest for 20 years, he's a professor. And Father McDonald leaves me in charge, and he simply submits, never ever made me feel uncomfortable about you know, him being the one who should be in charge, and not me, just very gently and always serving. So I'm grateful for that. Of course, for our deacons, I'll miss them. And for all of that, I give thanks to God as I leave this parish. And I will miss you, all of the great experiences here, because I have met some of the greatest families that I know here at St. Joseph's, the greatest Christians I know, people who live heroic lives every day and no one sees them. People who spend so much time attentive to their children, making sure that they know God. And it's been a great experience and I will take it all with me as I continue my adventure with God in His church. And I ask you to pray for me, continue your prayers because I hope uh, the journey will always be adventurous as it has been so far. You have helped me to grow.
grow as a priest. And I would like to close with a quote from St. Augustine, just to remind us about the goal of our life. St. Augustine says, Don't go looking for any end beside God. By looking for an end besides God, you will find yourself being consumed, not complete. What is an end, after all, but a point we wish to reach to stop and not to look for anything beyond it? Because if you get there and are still looking for something, you haven't yet reached the end. So to reach the end, which is God, it is to reach the spot where you can say, that's enough. May God bless you.